All right, good morning. For uh, everybody that showed up at 11 o'clock and stuck around, I really appreciate it. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, the team at Edmunds.com that uh, really took the first steps in trying to get the website uh, running out of its on-premise data center and into AWS. Let me start by sharing something you probably already know, that moving isn't easy. I, uh, I actually recently made a move on my, uh, move on my own, and uh, I'd, I'd been in my home for about maybe two and a half or three years, and I'd spent a lot of time really crafting the, the home theater center that I had in my living room. I knew that thing really, really well. I knew it inside and out, the way every single cable was laid down uh, from the back of the receiver to each of the floating speakers. And the thing that I dreaded most in making this move was trying to figure out how to make that thing that I had really put a lot of time into sound and look just as good in my new home. And that's what moving is all about, right? Moving is about taking something that you're intimately familiar with and trying to figure out how to make it work somewhere else that you're really kind of new to and you're starting to feel out. And those challenges are really no different than what the team at Edmonds ended up facing when trying to figure out how to make the website run on AWS. And so that's what today's story is about. Uh, today I'm going to cover a little bit about the Edmunds.com architecture. Uh, it's important to understand the architecture so that you really have a, a, a good context for what it took to, to pick it up and, and to move it into AWS. Uh, we'll, I'll share a little bit about, about the use case, why make the jump to AWS. We'll talk about the approach and the challenges that the team encountered along the way. And I'll give you a little bit of a preview into what's next for admins.com on AWS. Who am I to tell this tale? My name is John Martin. I have about 15 years of experience in the dot-com space. I spent the last 10 years with a very specific focus on Java architectures. Uh, I'm a highly opinionated individual, so if there's anything that I say today that offends you or you want to come and question me or talk about it further afterwards, you can find me uh, on Twitter at TechBuddha. Uh, I most recently headed up the team at uh, Edmunds.com that actually brought it to life on AWS. Uh, how many people are actually familiar with Edmunds.com? Awesome. Cool. Well, for those of you that aren't, Edmunds.com is the online automotive presence. Uh, new vehicle research, uh, used vehicle research, whether you're looking to connect with a dealer uh, or you're a hobbyist and, and you're like myself, you're waiting to hear what Subaru is going to announce next week at the LA Auto Show about the next generation WRX, you're going to find all of that on Edmunds.com. Uh, Edmunds originally started as a print magazine in, in 1966. And their first online presence was actually as a gopher site in 1994. Any old school gophers? No? Awesome. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the first website actually made its appearance in 1996. The site averages somewhere between 600,000 and 650,000 unique visitors each day. Uh, there are roughly 550 employees uh, working for admins.com right now, and they're based out of sunny Santa Monica, California. So let's talk a little bit about Edmunds architecture and its environment. When you hit Edmunds.com, you're interacting with one or more of 30, 40 different web applications that are spread across roughly 300 hosts. Uh, this is primarily a Java shop. Uh, it is built around Tomcat and Solar, Oracle Coherence, MongoDB, and uh, there are still a few web apps that are hanging around that are interacting with uh, an Oracle database of some kind. We use a lot of different tools uh, to build and support uh, the website. Uh, I've already mentioned a, a few of them. Uh, very big fans of, of Chef. Uh, there was really no way to, to build and manage what it is that we did without some sort of configuration management solution. Uh, in order to build and mon uh, sorry, in order to monitor and keep tabs on what's happening with the website itself, there's a very heavy use of Splunk and tools like App Dynamics. Uh, JMeter, uh, we're very big fans of JMeter and Selenium in order to uh, uh, performance test and, and kind of get a feel for how things are, are actually doing build to build. Uh, and there was a recent shift 
uh, from a traditional Oracle data warehouse uh, to a, a new Hadoop service. Uh, lots, of different, lots of different tooling in there. Edmund is a continuous delivery environment. Now, if you're not familiar with the notion of continuous delivery, let me see if I can summarize it as simple as this. Continuous delivery is the idea that a developer is developing locally on their workstation. They make a commit into some sort of source control repository. Uh, some sort of scraper process is watching check-ins and will then pull all of that code together, automate a build, attempt to do some sort of uh, testing, whether that's unit testing or performance testing. And based off of the results of that test, it will push your build artifact into an integration environment, into a QA environment and ideally all the way out to a production environment. Uh, Edmunds has a, an incredibly advanced deployment pipeline. Uh, this is built through a combination of tools uh, such as Perforce, Maven, Selenium, Jenkins. Um, uh, Chef is, is playing a very big role in there. Uh, and there are a couple of homegrown tools that go by the name of Kingpin and Ronin that really kind of bind everything together to keep the bits moving through the pipeline. Nearly every single artifact that is used to run the website each day makes its way through this pipeline in some way. And those that aren't are on a very short list to get tackled uh, in, in the near future. Um, maybe one thing to, to point out about uh, some of the advantages of this pipeline. Uh, over, over a period of time, uh, Edmund's release cycle has evolved as this pipeline itself has evolved. Uh, we used to do uh, scheduled um, uh, book of business releases every single month. And as the pipeline developed, we were able to shrink that down to three weeks. And now it's down to one week. And I have no doubt that sometime in the very near future, it's, it's going to be moved down to days. So uh, the, the deployment pipeline plays a very big part in how services are moved from development up into production. So let's talk a little bit about the business case for uh, tackling admins.com on AWS. It's, it's a very simple one. It was disaster recovery. Up until this point in time, uh, previous attempts to try to build a disaster recovery site for admins encountered some sort of issue. And they, they were generally related to the cost of, of attempting to deliver that. Um, uh, we, would get, we would get partway through the effort and then have to stop due to the cost that, that we were incurring in trying to make it work. And so AWS provided a fantastic opportunity to do it, uh, I don't want to say on the cheap, um, but, but do it in a more cost-effective manner that, that was very easy to, to sell to the executive team. Um, I have to imagine uh, that you are a similar frame of mind as myself if you are here at AWS reInvent uh, when I say that uh, if, if you or your business are, are not thinking about how to operate in a public cloud these days, that's a, very dangerous, uh, that's a very dangerous thing for you to be avoiding. Um, and so Edmunds, Edmunds was kind of no different. Uh, the, 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 the idea certainly started as a uh, disaster recovery notion, but quickly has started to evolve into something else, and we'll cover that a little bit later. Up until this point, there really hadn't been any attempt to get admins.com to run on AWS. Admins uh, previously ran a separate property called Inside Line, which was really kind of a, a, an auto-enthusiast website where you could go and get the latest automotive news, uh, nice high quality photos. It was, it was really for the auto geek. And it was typically used as a property for us to experiment with uh, new different types of technology. And there happened to be a, a particular need to take the inside line property offline for a couple of hours so that some sort of maintenance on the infrastructure that it ran on could be, could be completed. And the team that was supporting inside line didn't want to incur this outage. And so what they decided to do was, was try to get the site to run in AWS. And they did this remarkably well. They did this with less infrastructure than what was being run in the on-premise data center, and they got better response times to the website. So that was kind of a, an eye-opening experiment. 
And I think, I think it ended up fueling the interest in attempting to get admins.com itself to really run. So let me tell you a little bit about the approach, because trying to figure out how to take 30 plus web applications and roughly 300 servers and make those run in somebody else's data center was really tough. Um, like I said, moving isn't easy. How do you take that thing that you're intimately familiar with and just make it work somewhere else? The answer is you forklift it. You just pick it up and you leave it exactly the way that it is. You change it the minimal amount that you have to and you try and make it run exactly the way that you know it. And so that's what we did. Now look, AWS offers a whole lot of flexibility. There, there are a vast number of services that you can begin trying to, uh, trying to rethink your architecture around. Um, but one of the things that we realized was we didn't want to bite off too much at once. We really wanted this project to be successful. And the idea of trying to refactor an entire website to make it run in somebody else's data center was just something that we didn't want to tackle right away. And so we set, we set some very minimal objectives. The first was we wanted to minimize the change to the services and the architecture. We wanted to be certain that the people that were already supporting the website day over day were familiar with what it was that would be handed over to them at the end of the project. We really wanted to leverage the existing tool chain incredibly important for us that, that we were minimizing the, the way that people would be supporting it uh, when the project was completed. We needed to manage the cost. We, we actually had a, a fairly decent budget for this project, uh, but it wasn't unregulated. We had to demonstrate why, why the expenses that, that we were asking for were actually uh, 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 being requested. Um, this had us ending up adopting uh, what we called the 1% versus 100% model. And the basic idea was that we wanted to run with the minimal amount of infrastructure necessary for as long as we could in order to prove the functionality of the site. And once we felt like we had a good handle on that, then we could burst up to the 100% profile necessary to actually support real production traffic. That ended up paying off in, in big ways. Um, we, we kept the cost footprint very low, and when we were finally ready to start incurring a larger expense to see real users on it, that's when we began to pay for it. One of the other things that this, this team recognized was we were really kind of taking those first steps that we were expecting, or that we were hoping, rather, that uh, the organization would end up adopting later. And so we wanted to provide a, a good set of initial design patterns that could be followed later. We, we really wanted to be certain that anything that, we were, anything that we were changing about the architecture could easily be refactored or replaced if, if it just didn't end up being a good fit in the long-term design. So with those objectives in mind, we started our work. Um, like I said, moving isn't easy. And without a doubt, uh, this, this team had, had some issues in trying to take this thing that we were intimately familiar with and making it work in AWS. So here we go with those issues. AWS CloudFormation, if you're not familiar with it, is essentially the idea that you define your environment in a JSON stack file. And based off of that stack file, your resources are created within AWS. Uh, we viewed CloudFormation as necessary from day one. And the reason for that was we had a, we had a real fami familiarity with the idea of stack files already. Internally, we're big CloudStack users, and CloudStack also has the notion of a, of a JSON stack file. Uh, there are a couple of differences, um, but overall, the concept was incredibly familiar to us, and we really saw the advantage of, of defining the environment in, in files as opposed to manually creating resources uh, over and over, either through the command line or through the AWS console. 
So this is an example of a cloud stack JSON. Uh, it is structurally different than the CloudFormation stack, um, uh, particularly in that uh, you are naming uh, individual host resources, um, as opposed to cloud, uh, CloudFormation JSONs where you are defining services or, or resources, uh, uh, groups of resources uh, in auto scale uh, definitions. Um, one thing I'd, I'd really like to point out, I'm hoping you can read it, is uh, the service defini definition here, um, which is uh, essentially the declaration of the size of the instance that, that we would like to have provisioned in, in CloudStack. Um, you'll notice that uh, the service size name is, is actually uh, uh, matched against an AWS instance size offering. Uh, the reason for that was uh, after a lot of discussion with both the off-premise and the on-premise on uh, cloud teams, we decided that <clears throat> if we had some sort of parity in the, in the instance definitions, it would be much easier later for, for everybody to have a, a, a clear picture of what exactly was being provisioned and where. Uh, the, maybe the other thing to point out is that there are no network resource definitions in these, in these cloud stack JSONs. Uh, whereas in the CloudFormation JSONs, we can actually do declaration of network resources. Uh, we could configure the VPC. Uh, we, can, uh, add or, uh, we can add members to um, ELBs. Uh, that actually came in very handy for us. Uh, so you can see that there is actually a lot more content in a CloudFormation JSON. And this was actually something that became somewhat problematic for us because at first, we were manually editing these JSONs. And um, you can tell that, that, that there is quite a bit of information uh, uh, to try to get right in these JSONs. And, and a linter will only help you with uh, syntax errors so much. And so we became intimately familiar with the CloudFormation Validate tool, which is a CLI uh, tool that I think is now a part of the AWS CLI suite. Um, to help validate that we, were, that we were getting the syntax and the structure of these documents right. Um, if I could offer one, one suggestion to anybody, if you're, if you're still manually editing uh, CloudFormation JSONs, you should really consider building a tool to help generate these for you in some way. Um, they can be incredibly problematic, even though um, some of the newer, uh, uh, some of the more modern text editors like Sublime Text can help you do modern or uh, multi-selects and whatnot to make it a little easier. But, if you, if you have the, the capability to do so, build a tool for it. NFS is still a central part of the admin's architecture. Um, every single web application that runs on the website has a dependency on a, on a single NFS share where metadata related to the content management solution uh, pulls info up that, that the web apps use to determine uh, what sort of content to render and display out. Um, we couldn't really pick up the NetApp filers and move them into AWS. Um, and so we went to the development team that built this CMS framework for, for admins, and we asked them what it would take to, to uh, rewrite the framework in a manner that the NFS volume wouldn't be required, and instead we could just share, uh, share the content in a different manner. We were particularly interested in trying to make it uh, servable out of S3, given that it's relatively static content. Um, but given that there were so many touch points, so many artifacts that would end up having to be rebuilt in order for that to work, we really deemed it uh, just overkill. And instead, what we opted for was um, a very, very simple solution. Uh, we provisioned up a, a rather large EC2 instance, uh, attached, attached some storage to it, and then exported that volume out for the web applications to share. Um, I wouldn't recommend this, quite honestly. Uh, it is a single point of failure in the architecture today and will absolutely require a refactoring of the web applications in order to make it more resilient for the long term. Uh, surprisingly, uh, performance wasn't an issue here. Uh, one of the things that we were worried about uh, in the initial testing was that uh, the pages would be rendering slowly because of the time that it would take to read off a volume that was, 
that was essentially being hammered by uh, 300 hosts to a single NFS, to a single EC2 uh, server. Um, but you know, thankfully, that, that really wasn't a problem for us. Perhaps the, the biggest challenge of all was how we approached load balancing. In the on-premise data center, the, the physical load balancers played a very big part in, in application functionality. Uh, there were load balancers at both the web and the application tier. And uh, Edmonds had developed a, a custom tool, which you can actually find on GitHub. It's been open source, called the ETM, the Edmonds Traffic Manager. And the role of the ETM is essentially to act as a service registration for the web applications. So very simply, uh, a web application can come online. Uh, it can notify the ETM that it is available to serve requests for a particular URL path. And the ETM says, great, you are this web application. There are others like you over here in this load balancer pool. Go join that pool. Or if there is no web application yet that is claiming that particular URL, it will create the pool in the load balancer, and as members come along, they can join that pool. It will then auto-generate an Apache HTTP configuration file that is, that is pushed to the proxy web tier, which knows directly, which knows which, uh, which pool in the application load balancer to then send traffic to. Uh, ETM is, it was an indispensable tool at Edmonds. And uh, at the time that, that this project was underway, it only interacted with Apache Web Server and the physical load balancers in the on-premise data center. So we needed to think about a completely different solution to run in AWS. And we settled very quickly on the idea of adopting HA proxy to replace the, the URL redirection that we had in the application load balancer uh, and ELBs in front of those in order to help distribute traffic to the, uh, to the HA proxy instances. Uh, the problem we had, though, was that we needed a way to replace ETM's functionality. Um, how, do we, how do we allow auto-registration of the applications and, and, and understand how traffic is going to end up being directed? Well, we got pretty crafty, and one of the members of the team actually spent a weekend writing a replacement for this service into a Ruby script. And then we turned that into a Chef cookbook, which, where we could leverage the, the use of Chef roles to essentially build this functionality that ETM provided us. Uh, this, this worked remarkably well. Uh, it ended up working so well that the ETM team at Edmonds ended up uh, writing extensions so that it could generate these HA proxy configurations for us. Um, again, remember, we had this idea that anything that we were putting in or changing could easily be refactored or replaced if it was determined that it, it wasn't good for the long-term fit. And this was, this was a very, very clear use case for, for that type of idea. Um, the connection uh, that we had with AWS was through a direct connect from the on-premise data center up into US East. And <clears throat> uh, at first, we were a little confused when we started to do some performance testing um, why we were seeing these huge outbound traffic spikes from the data center. And the reason for it was actually really simple. It was, it was an oversight on our part that we had configured for use with public ELBs as opposed to private ELBs. Um, that ended up actually being uh, a different kind of problem in a, uh, when, we, when we really started to get aggressive around the performance testing. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the problems we encountered there in a moment. So <clears throat> let, me, let me say this about autoscaling. It worked. It worked very well for us. Um, we, we wanted to set out with the idea that um, uh, things would be burstable based off of the load that we were sending to the environment. Um, the problem was that auto-scaling would end up leaving a mess for us after, 
after instances were getting terminated and disappearing. And the reason for that is primarily because the tooling that we were using on premise had just hadn't really evolved yet to deal with the ephemeral nature of, of AWS. And so what would happen is we would, we would burst out a large number of inst instances, we would do what work we needed to, and then we would scale everything down. But the instances would leave remnants in, in things like our Chef server, in our Xenos server, in App Dynamics, and uh, we really hadn't gotten to a point where the tooling could kind of clean up uh, after, after, the, after the burst. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, auto-scaling really saved our butts during uh, some of the recent uh, US East outages. Um, in one case in particular, uh, we lost roughly uh, maybe 10 or 15 instances, but they were instances in, in very critical services that were necessary for the site to function. Uh, once EC2 kind of, once US East kind of stabilized and, and all the services just kind of started to to do their thing again, auto scaling reprovisioned all those instances, and things just magically started working again. Um, so, very cool, very cool for us. Uh, now, granted, we still had to go around and do kind of a manual cleanup of the instances that we lost as a result of the outage. Uh, but you know, I, I'm fine with cleaning up you know 10 or 15 nodes uh, for the sake of keeping things running. So let me talk a little bit about testing because <clears throat> this, this actually was a, an area that, that we struggled with at first for a couple of different reasons. Um, I already mentioned uh, that the validation tools, both functional and performance, were in the on-premise data center and they were essentially validating the AWS environment across this direct connect. And, and at first we were kind of, we were, we were confused by the, the traffic spike that we saw coming out of the data center uh, over the public wire because of the public versus private EOB configuration. But once we sorted that out and we knew that we were testing over the direct connect, we encountered a different kind of issue. And the issue is this. The, the EOB algorithms <clears throat> that, that scale based off of traffic load have a, have, have a particular way that they determine when they need to be scaling. And we were seeing some, some really interesting, well, not interesting. We were seeing some really awful uh, response times during the performance test, basically telling us that the time to first byte of the request into this new environment were you know, upward of 1,500 milliseconds, where we were expecting maybe 70. And this was really confusing us. So <clears throat> we ended up doing some digging around the, around the web, and we found a, a really awesome document that, that kind of outlined uh, how ELBs think around scaling uh, uh, in, in, in your runway. And what we learned was that the ELBs will grow based off of the number of requests coming from multiple IP addresses. In our particular case, we were, all co we were, we were sending hundreds of thousands of requests from a single IP address, and the ELB basically went, yeah, I'm cool, I can handle this. Um, and it's true, it could, but with really awful response times. And uh, so this required a little bit of creative thinking on our part to try to figure out uh, whether or not the applications were, were encountering some sort of issue in serving up the request. And thankfully, we had a, a really good relationship with App Dynamics, which is a tool for monitoring uh, Java, PHP um, uh, inside the application itself. And we could tell that the requests that were actually coming through were performing just fine. There wasn't an issue at the application layer or, or at the uh, data stores behind it. And so that, that was actually very comforting to us. We could, we, could, we could say with certainty that the application health was great. We were just, we were getting, we were getting blocked at the front door. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so, I, I guess the, the one thing, uh, and, and I, was, I was happy to hear Dr. Vogel say it this morning, measure everything. You've gotta, have, you've gotta have a thermostat of some kind at every layer of your architecture so that you can really validate where the issues might be as you're, as you're going through these tests. So 
So with this big move, uh, there became some questions about what Edmonds does with AWS next. And there was a realization that AWS wasn't good just to provide the disaster recovery site that we'd really set out to provide. Um, there are some fantastic scaling capabilities. Um, the, the notion of cost-aware architecture really comes to thrive in, in, a, in a public cloud like AWS. And so Edmonds has, has begun to pivot and is essentially taking an all-in approach towards AWS. But there are definitely gonna be, there's definitely gonna be some work uh, over the next couple of years to, to see that as a reality. The first is that there's gonna have to be a huge refactor at the web application la layer. Um, web applications today, uh, even though they are highly, uh, they are highly modular, uh, or rather they are modular, they are highly coupled and they are incredibly dependent on one another in order to deliver the user experience. So uh, a, a decoupling of some, uh, or rather a, uh, uh, a refactor of these web applications to deal with some of the fragility that you can encounter in AWS is in high order. Uh, a rethinking of, of Edmund's data pipeline, how, how data flows to the website and how it flows out of the website is absolutely gonna be in order. The, the data warehouse team has, has spent the last couple of years uh, with a very heavy focus on fine-tuning that on-premise Hadoop infrastructure, and now they're gonna need to, to spend quite a bit of time thinking about how it's gonna work in AWS. Uh, the, the, the tooling, I've talked quite a bit about, about some of the challenges that we encountered with the tool chain along the way. Uh, the tool chain is also gonna need uh, is gonna need a, a lot of love to really deal with the ephemeral nature of, of AWS. Uh, the services that run admins.com today are, are fairly stable, uh, but they have become very comfortable in a static environment. There is, there is not a lot of, of bursting, there is not a lot of taking away. It, you know, a, a host gets provisioned, and it generally, generally lives for as long as that service is expected to live with zero change. Um, this, is, this is going to, to change drastically as Edmonds tries to figure out how to really take advantage of what AWS has to offer. A lot of what I've talked about this morning, uh, about 95% of the work was actually accomplished by a team of three that were huddled in a, in a little room for a period of about four and a half months. Uh, making the big move. Making the big move out of your data center, it needs to be an all hands effort. Uh, you, you, you really can't make the kind of change that is necessary to really embrace what it is that AWS has to offer by just taking a forklift approach. And it can't just be done by a small team. It's really gotta be an all hands effort. And so that's, that's uh, part of what, what Edmonds is gonna be facing over the next couple of years. Oh, maybe one particular point that I, that I happened to miss uh, in an earlier slide. Um, was one of the challenges that this team encountered was uh, despite the minimal number of changes that we had made to the stack, when we did encounter issues and we needed to engage service owners to, to try to get their help in, in figuring out what was going wrong with their application, um, those minor changes were very easy for uh, the engineering teams to get hung up on, uh, particularly around the, the replacement of physical load balancers with HA proxy. Uh, that, that, for some particular reason, was, was incredibly difficult to, to understand. And, and so there ended, up being, there ended up being a little bit of finger pointing going on that, no, that little change that you made uh, is what it is that's causing the issue, even though you know, we had, we had uh, enough data to kind of back up that that wasn't the case. Uh, I guess where I'm going with all of this is that it is incredibly important that as an organization, you embrace it in full. Uh, and, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that 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 has to be an all-in kind of approach into AWS. But if you're going with a hybrid model, where you're running something on-premise and you're running some stuff up in AWS, 
make certain that that is, is part of the engineering and architecture culture. Uh, without it, I think that you end up with, with some amount of confusion uh, in, in how people are supposed to support it uh, day after day. And I mean, that is, that is perhaps the most important, important thing that you need to try to figure out is how are you going to support it? The, the building and the designing of it uh, is certainly one thing, but you really need to be thinking about the, the staff that is going to be interacting with it on a daily basis. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was really fortunate to be a part of this project and be a part of this team. Uh, I have no doubt that over the next couple of years at Edmonds, uh, there's going to continue to be a lot of really fantastic work done as this refactoring, as this re-architecture, as this, this rethinking of, of how to build and how to deploy and how to support take shape. And I'm quite certain that you're going to hear a lot coming out of Edmonds in the next couple of years about the adventures into AWS. Uh, that's all I had to present this morning. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, there's plenty of time for Q&A. If uh, you don't want to uh, get in front of a mic, that's perfectly fine. Uh, please see me after the show. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.